everyone. Thank you for attending our very first education book discussion. This is a new series we're launching today, and I'm glad you were able to make it. We'll continue to host education book discussions every other month with authors of recent or sort of recent books about higher education or related topics. Thank you to our viewers and donors for making events like this possible. I'm Jenna Robinson, president of the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. The Martin Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to higher education reform. We advocate responsible governance, viewpoint diversity, academic quality, cost-effective education solutions, and innovative market-based reform. Before we get started with today's talk, I want to tell you about our next event in this series. We'll be hosting John Rose of Duke University on December 2nd, 2021, to talk about his book, Until Our Minds Rest in Thee open-mindedness, intellectual diversity, and the Christian life. You'll see information about that event on our website in the next few days. I'll hand the floor over to Kenny shortly, but I wanna take one minute to tell you all how this event will run. First, Kenny is gonna talk for about 20 minutes about his new book. Then Kenny and I will have a short discussion and at around three o'clock, I'll start posing questions from the audience. So to our viewers, you can post a question by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen at any time. And then I'll pose the questions to Kenny at the end of the discussion. And to viewers on Facebook, simply post your questions in the comments section and we'll be sure to monitor those as well. Also, I wanna let you all know that we are recording this event so you can watch it later or share it online and it'll be up on our YouTube channel and our website next week. Now I wanna introduce uh, our, our guest today and that is Kenny Zhu. Kenny is the author of An Inconvenient Minority, The Attack on Asian American Excellence and the Fight for Meritocracy. He is also president of the nonprofit organization Color Us United, which advocates for race blind America and the youngest board member of the Asian American Coalition for Education. Kenny's work has been featured on Fox News, Newsweek, The Epic Times, the New York Times Magazine and NPR. He is a commentary writer for the Wall Street Journal, The Federalist, The Washington Examiner, The Daily Signal, Quillette, The New York Post and City Journal. And he has also written for the Martin Center. Kenny Zhu is 24 years old and is the son of Chinese immigrants. He grew up in Richmond, Virginia and later moved to Princeton, New Jersey. He attended Davidson College and graduated magna cum laude with a major in mathematics and a minor in philosophy. And now, Kenny, I will hand over the, uh, the virtual mic to you. Well, I mean, well, thank you, uh, Jenna, for the wonderful introduction. Um, you might be wondering what a math major from Davidson College is doing promoting a book um, about Asian Americans. And I'm here to tell you. Um, and in doing so, I have a presentation um, I'd like to share with you guys. Um, so I'm going to share the screen now, and then we can walk through this, um, and I can, how does everyone see this, or do you, does everyone see this? Good. Awesome. So my book, An Inconvenient Minority, and, and again, Jenna has already given me this wonderful introduction, so I don't really need to go through it, but my book, An Inconvenient Minority, um, really stemmed from this unique, uh, this unique case that has been sort of gracing the nation over the past 10 years, the Harvard discrimination case against Asian Americans. So in 2014, a group of Asian Americans sued Harvard for discrimination against Asian Americans. Now, Harvard claims they don't do this, but the data shows very clearly uh, that Harvard places a ceiling on Asian American admissions to Harvard. Um, and they do this in the name of diversity, right? Diversity and inclusion. So actually Asians, if they weren't discriminated against by Harvard would make up about 43% of Harvard University student body. Instead, they make up about 19%. That's according to Harvard's own Office of Institutional Research. Asian Americans have to score 440 points higher on the SAT to have the same chance of admission as a black person to Harvard and 150 points higher to have the same chance of admission as a white person to Harvard. Um, and 
this is this is an inconvenient this is an inconvenient uh, paradigm uh, to the left's idea of well minorities need to be the ones who are uplifted because what happens when a minority becomes too successful what happens when a minority begins to overrepresent well then you actually have to discriminate against minorities in order to make way for other minorities. And I thought that this case was fascinating. It was interesting. Um, not only did I find this case fascinating and interesting, but I saw that it was spreading. Um, and my suspicions proved true. After George Floyd in 2020, a number of elite high school, public school systems across the entire United States, including Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Mathematics, the number one science and math high school in the entire nation, started implementing racial quota policies to limit the number of Asian Americans to get into these schools. Again, in the name of diversity, Thomas Jefferson had 73% Asians. It was 73% Asian. Um, and then it actually, um, uh, it actually lowered the percentage of Asians the next year to 50% and increased black students, Hispanic students, and white students. Uh, Previously, their objective merit-based admission system resulted in having 73% Asian Americans. So the only way that they were able to actually decrease the percentage of Asian Americans at this school was to implement this, this lottery system where anybody could, who applied, actually, if you got lucky, you could actually get in irrespective of merit. Um, and so this is, this, is the, this, is the, this is what's happening across the landscape. Uh, the, the, the attack on meritocracy in the United States is creating a, a subsequently an attack on Asian American excellence, especially in the educational sphere. And it doesn't just affect Asian Americans, but Asian Americans are the ones that are most deeply affected because of how, um, how, uh, how reliant they are upon merit meritocratic structures to advance in this country. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about an inconvenient minority. Where are Asian Americans today? So right now, Asian Americans have the highest socioeconomic income out of all of the races on average, the highest educational attainment out of all races on average. They inconvenience the left's narrative of white supremacy, right? The left makes this assertion. We know this assertion. Everybody knows this assertion. The assertion is that America is founded upon structures that privilege white people. That's their assertion. Um, the inconvenience, the contradiction to this assertion is Asian American success. How could a country that privileges and has structures based on increasing white people allow this minority, Asian Americans, to actually get ahead of them in things like education um, and things like household income? Well, the answer is it's because their narrative is not true. <laughs> their narrative is not true. Actually, America is largely a meritocracy, largely a meritocracy. And it is true that Asian Americans have faced discrimination in this, in this country. It is true that Asian Americans still face some discrimination. Uh, it is true that Black Americans also face discrimination in this country, but it's also true that white Americans, for one reason or another, face discrimination in this country as well. Um, um, and the trick is, are you going to have the values and the culture to be able to transcend that? so to speak, and Asian Americans do. Asian Americans study twice as many hours as the average American in this country. Uh, they have stronger two-parent family structures. They have lower rates of crime, lower rates of drug use. Those factors all combined together, including a passion for education, gives Asian Americans the values that allow them to transcend their lack of social privilege in this country to achieve middle and upper middle class stability. But because we choose these stable and economically successful paths for education, because we challenge the, the left's orthodoxy that minorities must be oppressed victims, we engender subsequently resentment 
from the left. This is the thesis of my book, An Inconvenient Minority. How do we know this? How do we know? Because we see it. We see it in Ivy League admissions. We see it in the way the elite left treats Asian Americans. So I wanna point you to this graph here. Um, you can see the, you can see between 1990 and 2012, I mapped all seven Ivy League universities and one other university, Caltech. Why did I put Caltech there? I put Caltech there because Caltech has a policy express that expressly, that expressly bans race-based affirmative action. They're not allowed to use race. Actually, that's required by California that you're not allowed to use race in the admissions process. As you can see, all seven Ivy League universities accept almost exactly the same percentage of Asian Americans starting in 2000. All seven, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Penn, MIT is a little higher, Stanford's a little higher, but they're all much, much lower than if Asian Americans were accepted just on, on merit alone. Um, and just to show this, you, I, I just graphed Caltech's admissions right there. You saw Caltech went from 20% Asian Americans in 1990 to almost 40% Asian Americans in 2011. Caltech, which is banned from practicing race-based discrimination, um, shows the true curve for where Asian Americans would be in Ivy League admissions if they were admitted solely on the basis of academics, grades, test scores, uh, extracurriculars, and things like that. Now, how, now, this alone is kind of a sobering fact, but the way that Harvard and Ivy League universities do this shows exactly how much resentment and spite the uh, elite left has for Asian Americans. Um, Harvard, in the, in the court case, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, which is the Harvard discrimination case, uh, it was revealed that Harvard grades applicants on three qualities, largely speaking, academics, extracurriculars, and personality. Asian Americans score highest on academics. They, out of all of the races, they score highest on extracurriculars out of all of the races. They score lowest on personality out of all of the races. How does Harvard measure personality, you may ask? Well, they measure it according to what they call likability, humor, leadership, being a good person, friendliness. Um, you know, a, a, an example of a leader. And Asian Americans score lowest on these scores. Um, this, is it because Asian Americans are poor leaders? I examined that, I examined that claim. And it turns out, if you look at the alumni interviews of Asian Americans at Harvard, they give Asian Americans the highest personality evaluations. Alumni interviews who actually meet the Asian Americans give them the highest personality scores out of all of the races. It's the admissions officers who have never met any of these candidates who give them the lowest personality rate. Now that's suspicious. That's suspicious. There's something fishy going on here. There really is something fishy. Um, and this, this case is, is, is fundamentally um, based around this is this personality score corrupt or not? And I argue yes in my book, An Inconvenient Minority. The Harvard discrimination case comes to life. Here's the thing. Harvard has spent over $40 million defending race, the use of race in their affirmative action process, in their admissions process. They spent $40 million defending this defending their ability to discriminate against Asian Americans. And in doing so, they crystallize the elite framework for how you can justify mistreatment um, of, of minorities in the future. They justify it. Uh, and this culture that they propagate where suddenly it's become more important 
have a certain background and have a certain complexion than it is to actually have meritorious evaluations. This culture propagates into all aspects of public life, including elite corporate life. Look at Facebook. Look at Facebook. Look at Facebook's numbers here. So Asians make up 54% of the tech employees at Facebook. They make up 45% of all employees. They make up 25% of management. And at every rung of management in Facebook, the percentage of Asians go down. Now, there are a number of reasons for this. You could argue that, you know, Asians, you know, have poor communication skills, for example. Maybe because they have poor communication skills, they're less likely to be promoted. That's fine. That's fine to argue that. I actually disagree with that, but it's fine to argue with that. But you have to understand that diversity and inclusion, the diversity and inclusion industry in America that is present in all, all Fortune 500 corporations now, that's arguing for more diversity and inclusion, they don't really care about Asians. Um, the diversity and inclusion industry in Facebook, for example, the chief diversity officer, Melanie Parker, says, we have an overrepresentation of whites and Asians in our workforce, and we have an underrepresentation of blacks and Hispanics. So we need to have a hiring process that affirmatively increases um, blacks and Hispanics and decreases whites and Asians. Um, but as you can see, Asians are not even necessarily uh, hired in a privileged manner, hired and promoted in a privileged manner. In fact, the, the argument based on this graph, if you, if you were to look at things from an equity-based perspective, is that Asians are actually discriminated in, in, in the promotion hierarchy of places like Facebook. But diversity and inclusion doesn't care about that because they're not looking at uh, the diversity aspect um, across you know, across the promotion hierarchy, they're just looking at the raw numbers and they see Asians make up 25% of leaders, that must be, that's too much. And I wanna to touch on this point that I have here, which is that I wanted, I want the, the reason why I stress Asian Americans, I understand that people of all races, you know, can, can be hardworking, can have high achievement, can be low achievement, everything like that. But Asian Americans in this country, if the attack on meritocracy continues, if the diversity and inclusion attack on merit-based hiring, promotion, admissions, and evaluation continues, Asian Americans are going to be the most affected. They're going to be the most affected. Why? Because their entire experience of success in this country is built on meritocracy, largely speaking. You know, if you're a rich, well-connected white person, and meritocracy declines, you can continue to prosper if you have social networks, if you have connections. Well, Asian Americans, Asian immigrants, they don't have any of that. So they have, to, they have to rely on their talent. They have to rely on their merit to succeed. And it's worked out well for them so far, but it, it will be the case that um, if the attack on meritocracy continues, it's not gonna keep working out for them. This is just a close up of the graph that I just showed you. Now I wanna talk about critical race theory, uh, which, I, which I is, is another locus in my book, An Inconvenient Minority. Critical race theory teaches that whites are the oppressor class, okay? The oppressor class. It used to be a fringe theory, now it's mainstream. You know, capitalism has done its work. Um, you have to give Ibram X. Kendi credit. He popularized this thing, you know? He made it widely accessible for a lot of people. Um, and he's, he's a brilliant, brilliant marketer of this critical race theory narrative. Um, but critical race theory is fundamentally false. Why? Because it cannot explain Asian American success. It cannot. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it hasn't, it doesn't mean it hasn't tried, right? It has tried. First, critical race theory argues that Asian Americans are white adjacent. They're like, they're like uh, adjacent to white people. They're like complicit to white structures. And this is obvious, this is wrong for a couple of reasons. 
One is that Asian Americans actually come from cultural backgrounds that are probably the least white, the least white. They come from the opposite side of the world. They don't even come here and they don't even speak English. So how could they be white adjacent if 80% of Vietnamese Americans come here and they don't even know English? It doesn't make any sense. But then, you know, critical race theorists will say something like, oh, well, you know, Asians come here and they're, they're um, uh, you know, they, they come here with money. No, they don't. No, they don't. They don't come here with any money. Um, the, average, the average savings of, of, of Asian Americans coming to this country is less than $1,000. They don't come here with any money most of the time, yet they still succeed. The final thing that critical race theorists will say about Asian Americans um, is that Asian Americans um, come here with more education. And that's the part that has the most truth. Asian Americans do come here with more education. They don't come here with more money. They come here with more education. But is that privilege, so to speak? Is that, is that privilege, so to speak? Because if you if you, you know, it takes work to become educated, right? Um, and, you know, my parents, for example, they came here with a so-called education, but in order to get that education, they had to work their butts off back in China because my mom didn't come from a rich family at all. She came from basically nothing in a farm in rural Guangzhou, basically. Um, and she had to work her way to get the education that he got to be able to come here. So if anything, all this does is show my, is actually prove my point that culture matters, that it's, that if we actually want to help people to succeed in this country, we actually need to cultivate cultures of excellence, you know, uh, that many Asian Americans do, because it's not the money ultimately that helps Asian Americans become successful in this country. It is culture, and it is a culture that values education, that values intellectual achievement. Um, but that's not what Harvard believes. Um, Jenna, how much more time do I have? Five more minutes. Five more minutes, okay. Um, there, Harvard, I, I wanna close with this. Harvard is peddling more than race-based affirmative action. Harvard is not just peddling race-based affirmative action, but Harvard is peddling the justification for race-based affirmative action. And they're selling it to ordinary Asian Americans right now. And the justification goes like this. Asian Americans have had more privilege in this country than black people. Because Asian Americans have had more privilege in this country than black people, that they need to move aside and let other minorities come and take their spots in the name of equity, in the name of moral, moral philosophy, whatever you wanna call it. Um, this is most famously, um, this has most famously been propagated by this um, Columbia um, English major named Eileen Huang who wrote a viral article in the website ChineseAmerican.org where she basically asserts that Asian Americans are actually racist against black people or black Americans. She says, anti-blackness is prominent in my Asian American community. Anti-blackness is prominent in my Asian American community. How does she cite this? She, she, she talks about some of her racist grandmas. That's how she cites this, you know, saying, watch out for that dark person on the street or something like that. And is there racism in, among some Asian Americans? Absolutely. But guess what? Is there racism among some Black Americans against Asian Americans as well? Absolutely. Just take a look at the Los Angeles riots. Is there racism among whites against Blacks? Yes. Is there racism among Blacks against whites? Absolutely. You know? And so you can't, but the, the point of the narrative is to spin a narrative such that Asians feel guilty. Asians feel guilty about the fact that they are educationally excellent. Asians feel guilty about the fact that they achieve. They're creating, Harvard is creating a culture within Asian Americans whereby the default is for Asian Americans to feel embarrassed that they study hard, embarrassed that they work hard. In that way, 
they can move aside and let somebody from a community that they perceive as less privileged to, to come and take their spot, ultimately. Ultimately, the justification, you cannot justify morally race preferences without in some way denigrating a community and, and, and selling that denigration to that community. And that's what Harvard is doing. Um, and this is, this, is, this, is, this is probably, you know, the biggest reason why I wrote my book, you know, An Inconvenient Minority. Because what I'm seeing in my Asian American community, what I'm seeing today in the entire culture, you know, with anti-racism, the, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is to make people feel guilty about their success, make people feel guilty about the characteristics that they aspire to, to be meritorious, to be excellent, to work hard, to study hard. I don't see this going anywhere good. This was exactly what Mao did during the Cultural Revolution. What Mao did during the Cultural Revolution was that he, he, class, he put people in two classes, the red classes, which were good, and the black classes, which were bad. And the black classes were, he, he taught children to rat on their parents for being part of the black classes or being a secret nationalist or a secret reactionary or a secret intellectual against Mao. And everything he did was to try to mentally and emotionally degrade the intellectual class, the bourgeoisie class. Everything he did was to degrade them. And I see the same thing coming across here today, not just in Harvard's race preferences system. Yes, in that system, but also in the way that it goes about it, in the way that diversity and inclusion goes about their business today, in the way that anti-racism is going about their business today. The purpose is to guilt and destroy a person's pride in their own success. And this is why Asian Americans can no longer be silent. Because if they do, they're going to be steamrolled by a diversity and inclusion ideology that does not want them, that does not want their success and does not want the future of their country to be successful. That is the title of my book, An Inconvenient Minority. Thank you, Kenny. Um, that was a great introduction to your book. And now um, we're going to move on where I'm going to talk to Kenny in a little bit of discussion before we open it up for Q&A. So the first thing that I think is important to note is that meritocratic values have been under attack across the board. And as you say, especially recently. Um, and your book and some of your other work has been a great defense of meritocracy and education. So why, what, what is the Cliff's Notes version of why should we defend meritocracy? Why is meritocracy the best way to uh, work college admissions or workplace hires or promotions? You know, why meritocracy? Because meritocracy built the modern world. That's why, because meritocracy, when you treat people, when you ignore a person's background, you say, okay, what can you offer? What can you offer? You get more competitive attendees, you get more competitive applicants, and you maximize your resources. You know, um, it's kind of like it's, it's kind of like this analogy. And by the way, the Martin Center has been, you know, one of what was one of the first sponsors of my work, um, and really the first people going out there and talking about meritocracy. So I really appreciate everything the Martin Center has done on that. Um, but I, I want to give this analogy. Um, would you give a, would you give a factory to a person who does not know how to run a factory? And the answer is no, you wouldn't. Doesn't matter if you give all the resources in this, in the world to this person, this person is not going to know how to run this factory. And it's the same thing with elite education. Would you give elite education to somebody that does not know how to fully take advantage of elite education? Absolutely not. It's like Harvard is sitting on a $40 billion endowment. It's basically a hedge fund with halls and the best resources in the entire world. And 
if you truly believe that humanity is good and you want to actually improve humanity, you should give those resources to the people that are most competent and able to actually improve the lives of people with those resources. That's why meritocracy has produced, has been able to build up countries, build up this country. That's why we need to protect it. I think some would argue that you know Harvard is is no longer the rigorous place that it was. You know, it's it's not giving people that uh, that elite education anymore. But that's a that's a talk for a different time. Um, right now, let's well, talk. Well, it's actually you know I mean it's actually true, and and but it's actually like it's a sort of a chicken and egg story. Part of the reason why Harvard's not giving the same rigorous education that it used to be before is because the quality of its applicants in terms of sheer eliteness, meritocratic eliteness has also gone down because of policies like affirmative action, by the way, which do not, is not just race-based affirmative action, it's affirmative action for legacies. It's affirmative action for children of donors. You know, legacies make up 25% of Harvard now, children of donors make up 10% of, of Harvard now. When you're tutoring, when you're teaching kids who are actually less academically meritorious, you actually um, have to, uh, you have to um, diminish in some respect the value or the, uh, the rigor of your education. And that's exactly why colleges like Caltech, which does not practice affirmative action, has gone from number 10 to number five in the world in terms of research papers, per, uh, research papers outputted in science and technology, despite having a sixth of the students as MIT. You know, schools that practice meritocracy do better intellectually than schools that don't. And that's the reason why Harvard is unable to accept, uh, is, is actually degrading in terms of its curriculum. Mm -hmm. So let's then talk a little bit more about how merit is defined. Uh, for university admissions, like at Harvard, which you said, that often means grades and SAT scores. Um, do you think those are appropriate measures of excellence and can you talk about, you know, if, if you do think so, uh, how those measures have been coming under attack? So I've gotten some criticism for defending SATs. Um, fun, here's fundamentally why I defend the SAT. SATs measure two things. They measure your innate intelligence and they measure your preparation. Those are both meritorious for a school. You know, if you're innately a genius, then yeah, you know, you're meritorious for a college like Harvard. But if you're not so much of a genius, but you study your butt off for the SAT and you get a good score in the SAT because you committed, you know, 60 hours of your time to studying for the SAT, then that's meritorious too. Good on you. Good job. Hard work does matter in this country, actually. And yeah, preparing for tests does matter. And you know what? You need an objective evaluation in this country. You really do. Um, uh, Grades are highly influenced, not just state to state, but teacher to teacher. Different teachers give different grades. How are you going to know? You know, if a person who gets an A in one school is going to be totally different from a person who gets an A in another school, you know, only objective standardized evaluations will help you to be able to compare, you know, the poor kid from the south side of Chicago to the rich kid in Brooklyn and have the poor kid be able to stand up to the rich kid and say, I actually got a better score in the SAT than you did. Even though the rich kid got all A's and the poor kid got all A's. That's, it's, it, that's the matter at hand. This, this, is, this, is, this is what meritocracy is about. So I, I defend all of those things. So that, that brings us back to Harvard, which you say in a chapter title is rotting. Um, and you know, as you mentioned in your talk, Harvard gave Asian students you know, poor scores on personality, um, but it sounds like the, you know, the rot goes deeper. Tell us more about you know, what's going on at Harvard. The rot is going deeper because Harvard is a very privileged institution. I notice how I use the word privileged. I don't say the word Privilege, the word privilege means unmerited benefit. That's what it means. If a person wins a race, you know, so, or wins the US Open in tennis and wins a million dollars, no one's going to call that person privileged for winning because he won on merit. Harvard is a privileged institution. The amount of resources that Harvard gets in comparison to the actual quality of education that it produces, I don't think anybody thinks that Harvard provides a 
a thousand times better education um, than, um, uh, I don't think anybody thinks that Harvard provides a thousand times better education than um, um, Northern Virginia or, or sorry, or like James Madison University, yet Harvard has a thousand times the endowment of James Madison University. So Harvard is, is on the peak and is at the top of the privileged food chain in terms of the amount of resources that are allocated to it, $40 billion compared to the actual excellent education that they're able to give. And what this does is this causes a sort of privilege anxiety among its students. You know, these are students who come into Harvard and, and I tell this story in my book, An Inconvenient Minority. It's a very apparent, very clear. These students come into Harvard and they become incredibly aware of their own privilege, not for being white, but for being at Harvard. And they find ways to justify that or make themselves feel moral because of that. And the way that they feel often moral is affirmative action, is race preferences. We say, okay, we need to increase diversity in our admissions process. Why? So we can solve our moral guilt for sitting upon such a privileged institution. You know, at least Harvard's admitting more black Americans now, right? Um, that, that makes us feel better. It's a feel good exercise for them. It's not actually about, for them, it's actually about protecting their privilege in some way and allowing them to avoid grasping the reality with the responsibility that they've been accorded by society because of the way that Harvard is structured in terms of resources. So I think another, uh, another important or maybe a devil's advocate question. Uh, many Asian Americans do very well in college and afterwards, even if they aren't accepted at a top college at an elite, at an elite college. Um, so whether they go to Harvard or UNC, they, they do very well. So what is the problem with racial preferences that favor, favor other minority groups if Asian Americans be, through hard work are gonna do well no matter what? Well, I mean, I love UNC, I, 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 you know, and you should go, I mean, and I, you know, in many cases, I think that kind of education would be better than a Harvard education. But it, the sort of the onus is I, I feel like I feel like the onus is to prove why you should be racially preferential, <laughs> not not the other way around. I don't think I don't think I should have to prove that you shouldn't be racially preferential. I think Harvard has to prove that they should that why why they should justify to be why they're justified in being racially preferential. And um, it is true that there are some studies I think that showed that. If you're a student who was a, the kind of quality who would be admitted into an Ivy League but chose a different college, I think the life outcomes are nearly the same. I think pretty much exactly the same. I forget which study that is. Um, but if anything, that just gives a further reason why Harvard shouldn't practice racial preferences. Because, um, because if you know, Harvard's just the justification for affirmative action has been, well, we need to give the minorities a leg up. You know, you we need to give minorities a leg up. And supposedly affirmative action is like a ticket whereby if you get into this university, you're going to have a leg up over if you didn't get into this university. Um, but now the research is showing that that's not even really true. You're not even necessarily going to get a leg up if you get admitted because of affirmative action. In fact, the new research shows that black Americans who get admitted into colleges in which they're mismatched to, meaning that they are um, not as meritor they're not meritorious for the college, but they get admitted to the college nevertheless. They experience higher rates of depression. They actually drop out of STEM majors at a higher rate. They, um, they, they graduate at a lower rate. They get lower grades, um, which tends, by the way, to correspond to their starting salaries of their jobs. So you're not actually even helping these kids by admitting them based on affirmative action. You're in many ways hurting them. Right, right. Thank you for mentioning that. That, that's, that research is available in a book called Mismatch by Rick Sander um, mm -hmm. and Stuart Taylor, which you're right. That, that's a great, great research, highly, highly recommended book. 
Um, so Kenny, recently you wrote for the Martin Center, you wrote an article and after your, your article was published on our website, we got a letter to the, to the editor saying that we were playing into the model minority myth. Uh, can you take a minute and respond to that? Yeah, so what the model- First, tell us, tell us, what is the model minority myth? Explain that for people who don't know. So the model minority myth is a term that I would call the left academia, especially Asian American studies, created to, um, created basically the claim of the model minority myth is that like um, white people hold up Asian Americans as sort of an example of a minority to succeed, who succeeds so that um, they can put down black people. And they can say like, hey, you guys, um, it's all about you. It's all about your hard work and everything like that. Um, and stop talking about discrimination or something like that. I would say that's, that's probably the best characterization, more, the most favorable characterization I can give the left in terms of the model minority myth. Um, so here's my response to that. Um, I don't see where white people have necessarily held up Asian Americans to be some kind of champion, um, you know, in this country. Um, what I see are Asian Americans coming to this country with no social privilege and facing a lot of structures um, that, that seem daunting at first, but through their own hard work and achievement are able to transcend those structures. Now, were they helped along the way by some white people? Absolutely, but I see no reason why Asian Americans who were helped along by those white people, those white people suddenly go back and they turn against other minorities who are experiencing the same things, you know? Um, and in fact, we've done a lot in this country to actually not just eliminate discrimination, but affirmatively, you know, make it, you know, enhance the opportunity structures for all minorities for, I mean, affirmative action, so to speak. You know, we have a large welfare system in this country that is disproportionately black. Uh, I think 47% of, of the welfare of people on welfare are black Americans. You know, we have, we're doing a lot to help uh, a lot of these people to give them opportunities to be able to succeed. You know, liberals argue maybe we're not doing enough. Conservatives may argue maybe we're doing too much. Um, but to say that the United States has like treated Asian Americans completely differently to the way that they treat other minorities is an inaccurate characterization. Lastly, I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell us about your nonprofit, Color Us United. What, what is it that you were doing? I, while I was working on an inconvenient minority, I was approached to become president of Color Us United. Uh, and the board who recruited me saw the advocacy that I was doing on behalf of Asian Americans, on behalf of meritocracy, and thought that it would be wise for me to extend that advocacy on behalf of this larger principle of colorblindness. Um, and, you know, um, colorblindness is a controversial term in academic circles today, but we need it. We need this term um, because people are now using racism and anti-racism as, as a political cudgel, as a way to get people to admit guilt that they, that they don't have you know, now anti-racists like Ibram X. Kendi is saying colorblindness is just about justifying a racist system. You know, now you have institutions who are saying, no, we shouldn't be colorblind. We need to see race more. You know, we need um, the, one of the metropolitan or orchestras in New York City recently ended blind auditions. Blind auditions. That means that you, you play your violin behind a curtain you play your violin so that they don't see you. They say, no, we need to see race again. We need to see you so we can affirmatively 
hire you into our orchestra based on your race. And we're progressing from a country in which principles of colorblindness are helping minorities achieve in this country to a country where you're gonna be judged on the basis of your background, not on the basis of the content of your character. Now the Salvation Army, which Color Us United we're working against right now, is asking their members to repent for racism. You know, um, and uh, they're the least racist organization in the world probably. I mean, with all of the incalculable amount of good they've done to minorities over the past 200 years. And they're asking their members to repent for racism. This has to stop. So we're organizing the ordinary members of the Salvation Army and other institutions to fight back um, and to, to give them the language that they need to show that America really is a generous colorblind country. So if you go on colorusunited.org, you can sign our petition and sign up for us and hear more about what we're doing. Thank you, Kenny. So it is open for questions. We actually have no open questions and no questions for Facebook. So unless something comes in right now, we are gonna go ahead and uh, end this session early. I guess you you covered everything. Nobody, uh, nobody has anything else to ask. Um, but thank you again for, uh, for speaking to us today. Uh, thank you to our viewers for tuning in, and I hope you'll join us two months from now when we have John Rose for our next education book talk. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.